My name is John Fultz, and I am the Director of User Interface Technology at Wolfram Research, which basically means I spend a lot of time thinking about our notebook front end. And I'm going to be talking about effectively using notebooks in 11.3. Um, and my talk is actually going to cover notebooks even at a more basic level. There will be a mixture of uh, just an introduction to notebooks generally. And, um, and covering some features which are new to 11.3. If you don't have a lot of experience using our products, I think this will be a nice gentle introduction for you. If you're a longtime user of our products, uh, uh, some of the things I'm saying will sound familiar, but some of the things will definitely be new. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, and just briefly, I'm not really sticking to this outline very rigidly, uh, but generally this, the kinds of things I want to cover, I want to define what a notebook is, and I want to give some patterns for notebook usage, and a few tips for power notebook usage. So what is a notebook? A notebook is a structured document. And when I say structured, Specifically, it's broken up into units called cells. And cells are typically denoted by uh, what we refer to as cell brackets that live on the right-hand side of the screen. And I'm hoping that you can see my cursor here, and I'm pointing here to, cell, to the cell brackets for these particular cells, and I'm highlighting them. So a cell, can contain narrative text, and this is an example of that. A cell can contain code, and so this is an example of some code written in the Wolfram language, which you can probably figure out pretty quickly what it's going to do here. A cell might contain images as well, and here's just a bit of code which produces an image. Uh, you can get images into the product uh, by other means, copy and paste and such as well, but this is an example produced by code. Um, and a cell can also contain math. And here we have a, a simple quadratic formula, and you can see I've actually put a little bit of typesetting in here, uh, typeset math, and more typesetting comes back when I evaluate. The structure of a notebook is hierarchical. So what I mean by that is that the cells coalesce into cell groups. And these cell groups are generally determined by specific cell styles. So in my set of examples here uh, below the fold, I have a subsection cell and I have a sub-subsection cell. The sub-subsection cell is grouped by the subsection cell, and you can see there is a grouping bracket out here that contains both of them. Actually, that contains everything here. And then the sub-subsection cell groups the things below it, and you can see an, an inner grouping bracket. And here is another example of a code cell, and we refer to these oftentimes as input cells and output cells. And input cells group output cells. And so you can see it created a brand new group when I perform the evaluation by pressing shift enter on my, on my keyboard. So cell grouping can be performed manually as well if for some reason you don't care for the, uh, uh, the particular way that things have been grouped. I'll just override the grouping here by going into the cell menu and using group cells together. And you'll see it changes the cell grouping entirely. Um, and now I'm gonna go ahead and undo that just by pressing Command Z or Control Z on my keyboard to undo that. And I also wanna demonstrate that cells can collapse. So this is convenient if you want to uh, take advantage of the structure to temporarily or even permanently hide contents. And so, for, um, and generally, you do this by double clicking on 
the cell or, or grouping bracket that you want to collapse. So I'm double clicking on the top cell here and it collapses everything. And when it collapses, you will see that the grouping bracket, the outer grouping bracket still exists with a little down arrow there. We also have, and this is new to 11.3, we also have um, for some cells, we have a more visible um, notion that you're working with a cell with a closed cell group, which is this opener right here. And you can see when I mouse over it, it highlights and I can open the cell group by clicking this as well. And similarly for the subsection cells. Um, I should also point out that in some cases, you don't always necessarily want to collapse on the topmost thing. For these, you know, for these section cell, subsection cell, you generally do. But in the case of input and output, well, you might want to collapse on input, but you might also want to collapse on output. Oftentimes the output is more interesting than the input. And if you want to collapse on the output, you can do that by simply double clicking the output cell. And this is what we call a reverse closed cell group. And you'll notice that the cell grouping bracket is here with a tiny little arrow that's pointing upward to indicate that this group is reverse closed. A notebook, uh, you may wonder where I'm getting all of these styles and colors from. A notebook's styles are defined in a style sheet, and this is true for all notebooks. So styles are displayed in the format styles menu. So here I just have a generic cell and I will open the format menu and the style menu. And you can see right now this cell is displayed in the text style. I have the check mark next to the text style and I can change it to be something else like for example, a section cell. All of the most common styles can be accessed by keyboard shortcuts, and they tend to be the same regardless of which style sheet you use. And there are many style sheets. Um, I will not actually demonstrate the style sheets because that would mess up my slideshow a bit. But let's show. Um, so here you can see that there are various, various styles which are bound to command one through Command-9. This is on my Macintosh. On a Windows machine or a Linux machine, they're bound to Alt-1 through Alt-9. And most of these styles tend to, they may be visually distinct, but they tend to have the same names and the same functionality from, from one style sheet to the next. You can also make your own styles. And let me demonstrate making your own style just by doing format edit style sheet. Now in this case, I have a notebook that already has a private style sheet. If you were to do this on a brand new notebook, it wouldn't have all of the interesting extra styles here. But let's just go ahead and define our own style. So I'm going to define a style called my style. I'll just press enter. And here we go, it's added my style to the bottom. And let's do something to my style to make it visually distinct. So we'll look under the format menu and let's set its text color to green. And let's set its background color to say light orange, just to make it especially garish. And let's set its font size to be fairly large. And we could, of course, have done any number of other things too. Not even just font attributes. We might, for example, change the alignment so that it centers. When we're finished with this, we can just go ahead and close it. Nothing will be lost if we close it. We can always get it back by hitting Edit Style Sheet again. And now I still have this cell selected. And now we will see in the Style menu, my style has shown up. And there we go with our garish color choices. Notebooks can help you track the history of computation. So in and out numbers, track evaluations in the current session. And we've already seen examples of this. I didn't specifically call them out. But here we have, this is showing the input 
is the eighth input that I have evaluated in this session. And this is the output corresponding to that input with the same number. Now, if I quit, and because this is this notebook front end is hooked up to a kernel, I can quit the kernel without quitting the notebook front end. If I quit, then these numbers won't be active in a current session anymore. And new to 11.3, we signify this by changing the labeling. And you can see the in and out labels continue to be present, but they are now have their numbers obscured. If we really wanted to know what number they'd been assigned in a past session, we get a tooltip that says it was in eight in a previous session, but the fact that it was an eighth input in a, in a kernel session, which is no longer alive, is not that interesting to us anymore. So let's go ahead and start a kernel again. And now we're back to in one and out one because we started our fresh kernel. And now I'd like to demonstrate one of the other things that we do with inputs and outputs, and that is indicating whether or not an input and an output are matched to one another. So I've just evaluated this, so obviously this output matches this input, but I might choose to make some changes. Say, for example, I want to change my cosine function to be a tangent function. And here, it looks like this has been disabled. I did not try this in my slideshow environment. There we go. So this is what you would normally see here. Um, the, uh, the dimming effect simply means that the output doesn't match the input. If I were to go back and retype cosine again, then the dimming goes away. But I type tan, and now I know that these inputs are not matched but I do a shift in our evaluation, it creates a new plot and they are now matched again. And this is pretty, uh, it's pretty good about figuring out what matches and what doesn't. For example, if I were to just add a comment here and the comment of course makes no difference to the way in which the evaluation performs, it figures out that the comment makes no difference and it returns it back to a match state. The notebook environment supports a rich Wolfram language authoring experience, as you might expect, of course. And let me just talk a little bit about that experience. There are a number of things that I certainly do when I'm working directly with notebooks, which um, which I hope that many people have figured out, but in case they don't, let's go through them. So for example, one of the things that I like to do when I'm dealing with the structure of a Wolfram language is to use triple click. So just like in any document editing application, a single click establishes a text editing caret there and a double click will select a word. But a triple click understands the structure of your program. And in this case, it's actually selected not just the geometric transformation that I triple clicked on, but it selects the entire geometric transformation expression. And this isn't just about the fact that it's in cell brackets either. So in this case, if I triple click plot label, it understands that the immediate structure surrounding the plot label was a rule. Plot label is used as an option and it selected the entire option. If I triple click on an opening curly brace, then it selects the entire list, not just the opening curly brace, also the closing curly brace. If I triple click and drag, so I'm now holding the button down on the third click, now it continues to select structure. So everything that I just did was using the mouse. I can also use the keyboard. Some of you may be really interested in keyboard navigation and wish people would pay more attention to it. I'm keenly interested in keyboard navigation myself. 
So in this case, I am pressing control period and this keyboard shortcut works on all platforms. I pressed it once and it started from where my insertion point was there inside geometric transformation and it went up one level in structure. If I press it again, it will go up another level in structure, selecting the entire geometric transformation. If I press it again, it will go up another level in structure, and so on. And in fact, you might think that it would stop here, but I can even press one more time, even though I have the entire content selected, what is the next level in structure that it might go up? It might select the entire cell bracket. And indeed, that's what happens. So in addition to that, I wanted to just briefly demonstrate the experience of editing code. So the code editor provides completions and templates and other Wolfram language facilities. So when you type, we have a curated set of completions and I can just press tab right here and accept that completion. And then I'm going to do something different here um, in this case, I'll go ahead and press tab, or I could have completed typing it, and now notice that there is a little thing that sticks out here with, uh, with an I, and that will take you to the help page. I'm not going to demonstrate that, but I will demonstrate this other side, which is the down arrow. And since I'm a keyboard guy, I'm going to actually access this just by pressing the down arrow. And now we see a list of possible templates for my plotting function. And I can choose whichever one I like. And I'm just gonna go ahead and choose the first one. And now that's pasted in. And if I start typing here, then I can do that for example. And now I can press the tab key and it will go to the next spot and the next spot and the next spot. Notebooks support rich data embedding, and this is something that has gotten even better in 11.3. The So first of all, starting with something which is perfectly possible before, I'm just gonna bring in something from, um, from our homepage here. Now, of course, I could refer to this import repeatedly whenever I wanted to refer to this image, but maybe I want to embed the image in the notebook so that I don't have to be on a network connection to access the image. Or maybe I want to give it to other people who may not have access to the image for some reason. It might be a file on my system. So what I can do is I can just click next to the image and I can begin typing. And here I'm actually writing a program with an inline image. Now at the image change size, that was just for the convenience of being able to type around it. The image is not fundamentally any different when I do an evaluation, it's going to work exactly as it would on the original image. So that's something that we were able to do before. Here's something that's new. So we have this facility called Iconize. I'm gonna go ahead and evaluate this right now because this takes just a little bit to evaluate. What Iconize allows us to do is it allows us to take what may be a large and messy thing that lives in the kernel and embed it in your notebook. So in this case, well, I might have a problem here partly because this did take a long time to evaluate, partly because GitHub has some limitations where if you hit them too hard too many times from a given machine, then they may block you out for an hour or something like that. I don't want that to happen. So what I've done is I've created an iconized blob, for lack of a better word here, that represents the entire data. And so now I can actually begin just doing, um, just treating it as if it were the in-place data. And so I'm just going to assign it to a variable. 
show some output. Now, the important part of this to understand is that this data actually lives in the notebook. So I could delete this cell entirely and leave only this cell and then give it to someone else and they'll be able to work with the same data set that I'm using here. So in this case, I've made an iconize blob by using the iconize command. You can also make an iconize blob. Let me collapse this. You can also make an iconize blob interactively. And so I'm just going to take, let's say the first 25 elements of that data. And here, well, it's kind of messy. Um, maybe I want to embed this as an example, but I don't want to look at this. This is kind of silly. I, maybe I want to get the flavor of it, but I don't want to look at it. Well, let's use our triple click drag trick, which we learned. And I'm going to triple click drag. Oh, uh, let's say just everything except the first element and the last element. Now I'm going to right click and I'm going to choose iconize. And now, this is an equivalent expression. If we evaluate it, it will be exactly the same, but we've hidden 23 items in this list. And in this case, I used it to represent data, but it doesn't have to be data. I could have used this to represent code as well. Notebooks are fully computable entities. And this is something I always like to emphasize. So notebook elements are discoverable objects which, which can be manipulated. And I won't be able to go very far in the time that I have allotted, but here's just a couple of brief examples. So in this case, I'm assigning to the variable C an object which represents this cell right here. And now I can operate on the cell. And what I'm going to do for this input is I'm going to say, take that cell and set its background to be light blue. And I can operate in more significant ways on the notebook. In this case, I'm going to use notebook import to do a sort of data scraping operation on my notebook. All of these bulleted list items, these use the item style. And so basically what I am doing here is I'm taking all the cells in the item style and returning them as a list of strings. So I'm going to evaluate that. And then you can see in my result, all of the bulleted points that I've gone through and all the ones I've yet to go through. Now it turns out that all of the data in a notebook can be represented as a Wolfram language expression. So here's an example where I'm taking that C variable representing the cell here, and I'm just gonna read it directly. And here we go. And we can see this is what the underlying expression looks like. And so I'm going to make change to it. I'm just gonna use standard Wolfram language operations to change it, and this works very well. So in this case, I'm just gonna say, look for any case where it references the variable C, and let's replace it with the variable the cell. And then we're just going to write the resulting cell expression back into our notebook. And there we go, an identical cell, but except for having replaced C with the cell. What we've covered so far is using notebooks primarily as documents. And we've seen some examples of some embedded interfaces, but I wanted to make sure that that was one of the things uh, that's, that's very cool about uh, notebooks as documents is you can have live interfaces with them. And here in one line of code with an embedded graphic so that we can very easily see what's going on here, I've just created an interface which simply calls color quantize uh, with a variable number of colors, which is tied to a slider. And then it's going to show the quantize version and it's gonna show the, the histogram of the results. And 
let me, uh, and if I drag this across, you can see it more colors pop in and the histogram then gets more complex as I move to the right. And this is something that works in real time. Notebooks can be used for other sorts of documents as well. Uh, the help system actually is fully composed of notebooks. And so if I open the help system and let's go to a page, maybe a page for module, for example, and this is a notebook just like any other. It has evaluatable cells and I can run through and evaluate these things myself and, and I can make changes to them if I want and everything just works. Notebooks can also be dialog boxes and palettes. If you've used our, our product before, you've probably seen that we have a number of interesting palettes here. And so, for example, here is the basic math assistant, which you can use to paste in various sorts of typesetting. What you may not be aware of is that many of our dialog boxes are also notebooks. And so, for example, the find dialog box is a notebook. Well, it doesn't look very impressive, but because it's a notebook, I can. I can type in typeset expressions. And then let's go searching for a, a superscript x squared in our documents. And sure enough, there we've found it. <laughs>